This week on Always On, learn how to 3D print your own iPhone case. Watch me get served by a robotic waiter of the future. And a tiny projector that's also a phone. Always On is on. Hey, I'm Molly Wood. Welcome to Always On, the show where we look at the tech that's part of your life and your future. On this week's show, an amazingly cool DIY project and some outstanding emails from you, you drunken fools. I love you guys. But first, let's get to an unboxing. Inside this box, we have the Samsung Galaxy Beam. It's not even out yet. We'll get to the beam part in a minute, but we taped it up just so we could have a proper unboxing. May I remind you once again that knives always work better than scissors for opening boxes? Okay. Alrighty. Paper. And here we go. Galaxy Beam. Light up and share. Have a look inside our box here. One thing you will note right off the bat is the bumblebee motif with the yellow all around the edges. This phone's also pretty big and heavy. There are some good reasons for that, but you should sort of be prepared for at least the thickness and the bulk. All right, let's run through some specs. The Galaxy Beam has a one gigahertz dual core processor and eight gigs of built-in storage. It has a four inch Super AMOLED display, a five megapixel camera with a flash and a 1.3 megapixel front facing camera. It ships with, I am sorry to say, Android gingerbread. It does have a bigger battery, 2000 milliamps to help with that projection, although it's not as good as the Razer Max, which has a 3300 milliamp battery. It also has a micro SD card slot, which is expandable up to 32 gigs. Now, right about now, you're probably thinking, why would I buy that phone? I mean, it doesn't even ship with ice cream sandwich. And let's be honest, those specs are kind of middling. Plus, the Samsung Galaxy S3 is out. Okay, well, here's the hook on this one. It's got a built-in Pico projector. Yeah, get it? Beam. It's a projector. The projector bulb puts out a brightness of 15 lumens. It creates an NHD image with a resolution of 640 by 360, and the image can be up to 50 inches. It has various apps to control projection and playback, and something called ambiance mode, which lets you play any song or still image for a specific duration. You can use this little phone to beam videos or slideshows or pictures onto a wall up to six feet away. I'm surprisingly excited about this, or at least I was, until I watched Samsung's collection of heartwarming videos showing you all the possibilities. I'm not as pretty as those people, but I totally did this with kid pictures. Well, kind of. Whatever, jerk. So my video's not as heartwarming as Samsung's videos, which by the way, we're not very heartwarming at all. Like you're not really pulling off the Apple FaceTime thing and the music is annoying. And all I can think about is how all those kids are too young to have kids. And I just, I don't know, that's not working. But the beaming might be surprisingly cool. Although Samsung has not given us a US release date for this phone right now, you can order an unlocked version for about $600 and then root it to get a decent version of Android on it. But I think at that price, you gotta ask yourself if the beaming is really worth it. Head on over to CNET.com and read Jessica Dolcourt's full review to find out, because she's way less snarky than I am. Switching gears from Android to iPhone, Sharon Vaknin is here this week to show us how to make your very own 
3D printed iPhone case. All you have to do is find a location with an industrial 3D printer. No big deal, but once you do, it is super cool. Check out this one she made for me. Actually, as usual, her second attempt was better. Hey guys, I'm here back at Tech Shop to take advantage of their 3D printers. 3D printing isn't just for the super geeks and people making components for cars. You can use it to make everyday objects like an iPhone case. And today I'll show you how to do just that. All right, we're going to use a free program called Autodesk 123D. And instead of making the phone template from scratch, I'm going to use one that's already pre-made and loaded in this program. So now all I have to do is customize it. And I'm thinking I'll make it really personal. So I'll add my name to this. Actually, I'll go ahead and add my handle, Sharon Vac. And let's change the text. Okay, so this looks good so far, but right now it doesn't have any depth. It's not elevated, it's not a cut. But I think I'm gonna cut it out just like this CNET case. So I'm going to use the extrude tool. And since this is a 3D program, I can view it in 3D. So I'm going to change the angle here, and how cool is that? Now what I wanna do is cut this out, pull these letters out. Right click, okay. And now, check it out, I have Sharon Vac cut out of my case. That's it. I think that's pretty good, it's a custom case. I know I can't buy that off the shelf at Apple or Walmart or whatever, so we're gonna go ahead and print it. I have to do a few things, I have to save it as an STL file. Save it to my desktop here. All right, let's open up Replicator G. That's the program that talks to the actual 3D printer. So what you're seeing here is the platform. I wanna make sure that the phone gets printed in the center of the platform, so I'll do that. I also wanna scale it up just a little bit because the first time we printed this, it actually was too small for my iPhone, so we need to scale it up. But that's what's great about it. Uh, 3D printing is so cheap, at least here at Tech Shop, that you can really tinker with it. Now we are going to write the file, make sure all of our settings are okay, generate the G code, and this takes a couple of minutes. G-Code is an old school programming language that tells the machine exactly what to do. Okay, the G-Code is ready, so now I can put the file on the SD card. That will allow us to put it in the 3D printer, so save it, and we're good to go. Let's put it in the printer. All right, now all we have to do is print it. So I'm going to select my file and hit print thinking. All right, we're going to print it in this bright green color. That's what's hooked up to the machine right now. It's actually made of a corn-based plastic. There are other materials, but that's what the MakerBot works with. It's heating up. This is going to take about an hour and a half to make, so we'll be back to check up on it. The spool of plastic is pulled through the back tubes and into the extruder. The extruder heats up the plastic and pushes it through a tiny hole. Your object is made one layer at a time. Okay, it looks like we're at 93%, so it's almost done. And it totally looks like an iPhone case. It's only been going for about an hour, but it will need 10 more minutes until I can peel the sucker off and put it on my phone. Now, if you want one of these MakerBot 3D printers at home, it's going to cost you about $2,000. So, with a Tech Shop membership at about $125 a month, it's all free. For them, the cost of this spool, which is the material that's used to print, is about 40 bucks. So, altogether, my iPhone case will cost about a dollar for them. That's pretty cheap. Okay, now, it's not just for making iPhone cases. There are a lot of ways people are using 3D printing. These are some of the more fun ways, like look at all these baby Darth Vader sculptures. This is really neat. This one took about 84 hours to print and it was printed on a, a more advanced machine. Okay, this is really neat. People use 3D printing for prototyping. So this college sophomore made a kite that 
converts wind into energy. And he used 3D printing to create these components here. Okay, I think that by now, my iPhone case might be ready, so let's check it out. Okay. All right, it is stuck a little bit to the platform, but that's normal, so we're just going to use one of these guys to just nudge it off. I am so nervous and excited. Oh yeah, there we go. <gasps> okay, let's put it on. And it fits perfectly. Check it out, my own custom 3D printed iPhone case. Now, if you're dying to get your hands on this and you don't have a 3D printer or access to one, you can use a printing service like Autodesk or Shapeways.com. All right, if you have any cool ideas for 3D printing, please send them to me at Sharon Back on Twitter or send us an email at alwayson at CNET.com. Thanks, Sharon. Okay, I know that the MakerBot 3D printer is two grand, but don't think I don't have one on my Amazon wish list, because I do, and I'm looking at you, Santa. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, I make a new friend, a robot waiter, and I, for one, welcome my dinner. All right, how are we here in 2012 and we do not have domesticated robots yet? I know they're useful in car manufacturing and other industries, but they're not doing the really important things like folding laundry and serving us dinner. Well, they weren't until now. This is maybe one of my favorite robot demos ever. It's a robotic sushi waiter. It's the creation of Silicon Valley startup Willow Garage. They're dreaming up how and why we'll use robots in the future. Over the flowers. That was so smart. It's really, you know, I've been taking my digital dexterity for granted. Was it your goal to create that future where Rosie from the Jetsons is actually occurring? Well, our goal was to get robots out of factories, from behind the cages in factories where they could help people. Whether that's having a bot to shoot pool with, one that can fetch you a beer from the fridge, or uh, my personal favorite, fold your laundry, what is it that makes this robot do amazing things? Well, it starts with how it sees the world. So this is the, the PR2's head, and there, you see a lot of sensors. There's a high resolution video camera, a couple of stereo pairs. This is actually a projector that works with the stereo to give you better 3D images. Oh, really? And then the Kinect, is actually doing something very similar. It's got, uses infrared to project a texture in the world and then use that texture to also get 3D images. And while the PR2s are programmed to work autonomously, they can also run via game controller. <laughs> this is amazing. I want one. Look at dances. There's a turbo button? <laughs> There's a turbo button. <laughs> Everybody back up. Now, as cool as the PR2 robots are, hardware is only half the story here. Willow Garage is also developing an operating system that they've open sourced. So the hardware and its underlying software can work together to form the future of robotics. It's open source, right? It's open source. And so we've had about 160 interns visiting scholars from around the world come here for three to six months. And then they've gone back home and they kind of take the software with them. So they can program the robot to do things like clear a table, pick up a set of clean dishes, and then yes, even attempt to serve me sushi. He's so delicate. I think he's gonna take a bow. He's totally like, yes, I did, yes, I did. I did that. Boom. So what's preventing us from having a robot in every home? Probably the price tag is a pretty big factor. And how much do they cost? Uh, the list price is $400,000 US, so it's expensive. Um. Then, of course, there's the constant fear that robots will take over humankind, but Willow promised me otherwise. This robot is not going to take over the world. If you drop a 2 by 4 in front of it, it's done for. <laughs> See, that's what I like to hear. I feel very reassured. And reassured that my place was now set for a bite of sushi. Bon appetit. You could kind of see why they call this restaurant yesterday's sushi, because 35 minutes later or so, I have my bowl, my chopsticks, and my slightly wilted food. But I can definitely imagine the not too distant future where robots are servers and much more. And I for one look forward to it. 
I know what you're thinking, $400,000, and no, these robots won't be cruising around houses anytime soon. But Willow Garage thinks that pricing will eventually do what it always does with electronics, which means the future looks robotic. All right, it's time for my favorite part of the show, and I am not just saying that, it's the mailbag. First up, a clarification. We actually got an email from the Fitbit folks and several users saying the Fitbit does indeed sync wirelessly. You may remember that was one of my big complaints about Fitbit compared to Fuel Band from a couple weeks ago. So I feel like that's partly true. Here's the deal. If you have the Fitbit base station plugged into a computer, then the Fitbit can sync wirelessly with the base station if it's within 15 feet of that. Not quite as good as I had hoped. I guess I should have said though, the Fitbit doesn't sync wirelessly with the app. Although again, both of them are very good devices. And in fact, the Fitbit recently won a prize fight over at CNET.com, so your mileage may vary. <laughs> Speaking of variants, I got this email from someone who also chose Fitbit. Hi, Maggie. Loved your segment on Fitbit versus Fuel Band as I was thinking about getting one of those myself. After your review, was all set to get the Fuel Band, but I've gone with the Fitbit. Bottom line, the Fitbit has an Android app, Fuel Band doesn't. Also, Fitbit app syncs with MyFitnessPal and other services. Love the show. Take care, Chris. Thanks, Carl. It's always nice to have a devoted fan watching carefully. All right, I love the spirit of this next email from Aldea, who starts by saying, one, I may have had a martini prior to writing this email. Two, you totally missed the best thing about the Fitbit and therefore gave the Nike bracelet whatever an unfair victory. And then here she goes into a really long correction about the sinking, which we've already addressed, and then says, but my point, and I do have one, is that the best thing about the Fitbit is the social connectivity aspect. I didn't exercise for two weeks because my husband lost his Fitbit. And now that he has it back, there's no way I'm letting him get more steps than me in a day, week, year, whatever. I don't care what the number of steps is at the end of the day, so long as my number says I kicked your ass to my husband and to a lesser extent, his sister and sister-in-law, although they tend to beat us both. It's fostering the spirit of competition that makes the Fitbit great. And I should think that you'd be aware of that since this is an Olympic year. For shame, Mollywood. For shame. <laughs> I love a good drunken fitness related email. All right, actually, both of these products have their fans, to be sure. In fact, the Fitbit, I think, has a little bit of a cult. If you are a member of that cult or any other cult or just have feedback on the show, please email me, always on at CNET.com. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. That's it for this week, everyone. Coming up next week on Always On, we torture test an iPhone 4S. Sharon Vaknin cuts up a perfectly good SIM card for good reason, and I get some skydiving training. That's all next week. Thanks for watching Always On. So cold. Come on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't quite any time, really. <laughs>